Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and I'm really excited to have back on the show my old friend, Mike Edison. Mike, welcome. Oh, man, I'm so glad to be back. Thanks, Bart. Yeah, so um, you are an author. You're a cool guy. You're a drummer. <laughs> you do all kinds of uh, really neat stuff. Um, and our primary reason for talking today is because you have some exciting news. Um, your book, which people may remember we talked about before, Sympathy for the Drummer, Why Charlie Watts Matters, uh, is coming out on a paperback version, which is a little more affordable, and um, it's really exciting. So congratulations about that. Oh, thanks, man. And I got to say, it's a really deluxe edition, the paperback. It looks very smart. Uh, I mean, Backbeat did a fantastic job on it. Uh, there are a couple extra pictures in it. We got this cool all alternate cover, kind of from like the original design files, kind of like in the great rock and roll tradition, you know, like when the Stones do a reissue, maybe we'll yep. go back to the original cover. So we found like the cool alternate cover. So it's got kind of fresh vibe. And, and, and yeah, and you know, the, the hard cover uh, did, did so well. So many people uh, like you were enthusiastic and, and embraced it. I made so many friends, including uh, the guys in the Rolling Stones camp uh, yep. who, were, who were vocal and effusively uh, just really enthusiastic. Um, it's great. It's just yeah. Not only just the enthusiasm for Charlie Watts was so many fans, but uh, for guys who really dig the drums, like you and guys like me who really love the art and science of you know hitting things with wooden sticks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and as you said, the Stones Camp, which we got a upfront mention, our our mutual great friend Don McCauley, who's just hands down one of the nicest people in the world, and just anyone who knows him loves him he's charlie watts i guess he'd be considered charlie watts drum tech which that's a hell of a job right there but yeah. um just yeah. such a nice guy yeah don don is a mensch with a capital m yeah. uh i mean absolutely you know he, he's the nicest guy and you, you never know who you're gonna meet you know you know <laughs> in this filthy racket <laughs> uh <laughs> I, I mean i mean honestly the music industry is is filled with so many difficult personalities and egos and stuff and you never know who you're gonna meet or who's starstruck and you know who's kind of a sycophant or, or, or dilettante and you know and you end up meeting a guy like don is like the nicest easygoing most easygoing guy with like zero attitude and, um and mostly the kind of people i've met all have that ad attitude they're just like sure. really eager to be part of this like great community and they're fans you know and being a fan means giving up your ego it, 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 it's so great you know i mean don works with he doesn't just work with the stones i mean he moonlights with neil young and you too and he's got zero attitudes he's just you know it's fantastic yeah absolutely so um that's just great. And and I want to maybe mention now while people are listening, the kind of overarching topic uh, for today is really going to be about, I think we labeled it as um, the right drummer for the right band. Because I want to talk more about Charlie up front and your phone call with him and all this stuff. But just so people know, that's what we're going to get to is talking about, you know, the Keith Moons and the, uh, I think, Bonham and Charlie Watts, this special era where there was these guys who who were just irreplaceable, really. Um, I mean, some of them did get replaced, obviously, but it, it, it wasn't the same. It was the core group, um, and they were the correct people for the band. So we'll we'll get to that discussion. But first off, you talked to Charlie Watts on the phone. Oh, what yeah. What was uh, that like? And, you know, and thanks to you know, Don for kind of set it, setting that up and, you know, floating some books uh, out to, at the Charlie's farm. Uh, it was great. I mean, what higher compliment can a guy get? <laughs> I called him Charlie Watts who told me, you know, thank you for the, the lovely book. And, you know, listen, the Stones don't endorse any unauthorized Stones product. And, you know, there's a lot out there. Yeah. They're like the most documented human beings on earth, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, seriously, uh, you know, they, they, they walk on water and, you know, they don't really, uh, you know, pay attention to things people write about them. And to get a call from, you know, this purported subject of my book, and, and you know, the book is a lot, it's about Charlie Watts, of course, but it's about a lot more than that. It's about the history of jazz, and blues and rhythm blues, where it intersects with rock and roll and country and punk rock and, and disco. It's about, you know, it's about the big beat. You know, it's about that yeah. thing that makes us crazy. It's about, you know, the kind of revolutions that start behind the drums. And um, Charlie, of course, you know, is this great totem and encapsulates all of these things, you know, all of the good qualities of what makes uh, rock and roll, about putting the role in the rock. That really is the premise of the book. Yeah. But yeah, Charlie called me on the phone. I got a message from him. And this is uh, during the lockdown, too, which mm -hmm. is, um, I want to talk about that, too, because some crazy things happened when I found myself uh, alone with uh, free time, idle hands and all that. 
Uh, you know what? You know what's good for idle hands? Wooden sticks. Yes, keeps you busy. <laughs> yeah, keep, keeps the devil at bay. Get behind <laughs> me, Satan! I'll paradiddle you right out of here. Um, and Charlie left a message on my answering machine, and he called very early in the morning. He's in England. I'm in New York City, and I sort of was waking up and listening. He says, "Hello, uh, you don't know me. My name is Charlie Watts. I'm looking for Mike. I wanted to thank him for writing this lovely book, uh, and for having Charlie." Parker on your answering machine. Oh boy. Thank That's you. good. <laughs> okay. Dude, it's the best because I've had Charlie Parker on my outgoing message on my voicemail, like since I had my first flip phone. Wow. Like 20 years ago. It, I just happened to be listening to it while I was creating, you know, the, the outgoing message and I kept it all these years. It sounded good and I, I just never changed it. Oh. And he's the first person to ever recognize it. It all paid off. It was worth it. That I one did. moment. <laughs> and it's really like 10 seconds of music, not even. And it's just like this big piano glist. It sounds really wow. good. And he's like, oh, yeah, Charlie Parker, Cosmic oh, Race. Yeah. Thanks. I'm like, seriously, dude? <laughs> yeah. He's an aficionado. I mean, really, he is oh, my God. a master. He loves music. And that is part of the trip, too. And he's very, uh, I mean, his tastes are very um, Catholic with a small C, you know, meaning sure. that he loves disco. He gets it. He loves dance music. He's not a snob. And he likes more avant-garde jazz than any of the other stones. I mean, he's talked about embracing Cecil Taylor. He loves Alvin Jones. And he also, of course, loves all the big band guys and the early jazz guys and the uh, New Orleans, uh, you know, 1920s era jazz. And he's just got this huge open heart and open mind towards everything. And I, I called him back. I said uh, to my wife, I said, I think Charlie Watts just called me. I think I should call him back. His, his number is, you know, showing up here. Uh, so I called him back, you know, on his landline, of course, sure. Charlie, yep. right? Uh, you know, notoriously doesn't have a cell phone. Um, you know, he, I mean, make a sense. If you want to get to Charlie, it's just easier to go around his house than trying to call him on the phone. <laughs> um, and I said, hello. And I said, hi, is this Charlie Watts? And yes. I said, well, this is Mike. I think you just left me a message. And he was just so kind. And he's such mm. a gentleman. Uh, like I say, it's like having someone shake your hand wearing a velvet glove. <laughs> you, you yeah, know, and, very nice. And, and he said, oh, thank you for the lovely book. And we talked for a few minutes about um, some of the uh, old jazz drummers and the early rock and roll guys. And he really enjoyed it. And uh, I mean, it's just a very nice thing for him to call. And I thought I was being pranked. I mean, I thought there was yeah. a possibility yeah. because not probable, but not impossible, <laughs> you know, uh, considering the jokers I know. So I kind of had to ask him a secret question um, to get the high sign. And he passed. So I'm not going to tell you what it is. That's between me and Charlie. <laughs> sure. But, uh, but uh, I was like, oh, shit, Charlie Watts. And he, he was so nice and uh, finished by inviting me out to, to come see them if they got back on the road. And they, they had invited me uh, already, and I was kind of all set. And then the tour got canceled. Everything got locked down. Oh, man. Uh, well, but, I just want to note, too, that that is like the classic. There's like a classic movie trope that's like, you know, the rock star calls and you go, yeah, whatever. Shut up, <laughs> Jeff. Okay. And then they're like, no, it's really me. And it's like, that's just, uh, that's, right. that couldn't be more <laughs> like from a movie. I, I don't know. Really? It's the president. Call back the White House and ask for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. What a, what a just good story, though, about him being a nice guy and reaching out. Because I don't oh, think I, he does that to everyone. Really, I don't think he does that for anyone. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. And I'm not a starstruck guy. I'm a journalist. I've, I've worked around a lot of, you know, quote unquote celebrities and rock stars and stuff. And, uh, I'm not really starstruck per se, but gobsmacked, I think would be the word. I mean, it was just like, wow, my head was definitely spinning. Like what just happened? And damn, I should have had him on the phone longer. I should have asked him about this or, you <laughs> <Yeah>. know, <laughs> am oh, I yeah. hearing this right? Like, damn. Yeah. But uh, he was so super duper nice. And you know what? I've, I've, uh, uh, I met Keith Richards. He bought me a drink one night. Could not possibly have been nicer after I kind of insulted him. Too. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, because I bumped into him at the, lobby of the Apollo Theater up in Harlem during a James Brown concert, right? So it was, it was a very good place to be bumping into these sure. Richards. And I had ducked out uh, to have a drink, and uh, Keith was standing there having a drink uh, during the middle of the concert, and I saw him, and like, there was nobody else around because the show was still going on. And he, I, so I said, hi, and I kind of sheepishly said, you know, how much, you know, I, you know, I dig the Rolling Stones. And I had just seen the movie that uh, Keith had made about Chuck Berry, the Chuck Berry Hail mm -hmm. Rock and Roll yep. thing, which is a little bumpy, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, you know, I, you know, I, I love you, Keith, and you know, I just saw your movie, and what, what the, you know, f was going going on up there, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I mean, really, what was that all about? And um, as I live and breathe, he said to me, he goes, "Yeah, Chuck's a mother." 
I love him, but he's impossible to work with. Oh, Do you man. want a drink? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that's awesome. Uh, so I said, yeah, and uh, yeah. I said, I'm drinking Jack Daniels. So, well, that works for me. So we, we sat around drinking Jack Daniels, talking about Chuck Berry and James Brown for about 10 minutes until uh, I guess it, you know someone came around and recognized him. And he said, well, you know, it was nice, but I should probably get out of here now, yeah, yeah. go back and watch the show. But he couldn't have been nicer, you know? That's awesome. I mean, just uh, they I think they like those uh, those kind of one on one interactions that that aren't just being swarmed by crowds. So you definitely that was like meant to be, you know, catching him like that. Well, you know what the thing is, 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 uh, you know, I wasn't like, you know, blowing any sunshine up his skirt either. Sure. You know? I mean, I just, just very, I'm very candid. And uh, the book, Simply for the Drummer, too, that is you know, where I don't pull any punches, you know, I mean, it's definitely not a puff piece about the Rolling Stones. Uh, you know, they've made bad records and we talk about it, and, yep. you know, they've made a lot of missteps and, you know, and, uh, you know, you know there's Mick solo career <laughs> for instance, but, yeah. um, but it's a 60 year career coming oh up on, God. I mean, what, what you can't, they can't all be zingers. I mean, it's gotta be a little, uh, well, I mean, that's, well, that's so much time. It's not Charlie's fault. <laughs> no, that's very it, true. It's never Charlie's fault. Charlie is always good. In fact, he keeps getting better. That's the crazy thing. And that's part of the book, too, is that there's an evolution here where suddenly the drums start getting a little louder, you know, and yeah. he's not the same drummer, you know, by the time they get to Tattoo You, by the time they get to Some Girls, oh, my God, what a, what a pivotal shift in the way he was playing. And it's so aggressive. And, of course, he does that thing where he opens the hi-hat and, you know, off the beat and here and there. I mean, try playing along with it. It's, like, insane. It's, yes. There's no way to anticipate what he's doing. He's completely... He's finding jazz in a place where no jazz normally exists. I agree completely. And there's something to kind of segue a little bit into like the, 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 the bigger topic that we're talking about today. There's something about, I almost consider these like, you know, if you're going to have the Mount Rushmore's, like there's the Elvin, Tony, uh, Max, Art, sure. Blakey, Mount Rushmore over there. And then there's without a doubt this rock and roll Mount Rushmore that is... Charlie Watts, Keith Moon, John Bonham, and Ringo Starr, where I know everyone who's listening, I know there's a bunch of other drummers who would probably be up there who might be your favorite drummer, but I think we can all agree those guys are quite possibly the most influential drummers um, for rock and roll fans possibly yeah. ever. And again, there's tons more, but those guys especially are when your grandma knows their name, you know, they're special. But I'll tell you, you know, you know, who's the guy like Charles Connor who played the original Girl Can't Help It beat with Little Richard? Yeah. He's the unsung hero in this whole thing. I sure. mean, that's the intro to rock and roll by, you know, by, by Zeppelin. Bottom lifted it note for note, you know, God, God bless him. And that's what, you know, we get to too is these early guys because you say, yeah, absolutely, Charlie Watts and, and, and Ringo and John Bonham and Keith Moon. Um, but what about, uh, the guys that they got it from. Uh -huh. you know, what, about, what about Earl Palmer? Why isn't he on that list? Very true. You know, and, and Charles Connor, who's far less lesser known than Earl Palmer. Um, Earl Phillips was the drummer for Jimmy Reed. You know, the blues guy. You know that the Stones loved. And man, when I first listened to, to blues, when I got into it, it was a direct line from loving the Stones to getting to Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf, and then of course Wilson Pickett and soul music, but also uh, Jimmy Reed. Earl Phillips was his drummer, and it's that impossible shuffle. Mm -hmm. I didn't love it at first because I just thought it was, it was kind of slow and, and it was this groove and it didn't really shift all that much. And then you start playing along with it and it's impossible. Yeah. It is the impossible shuffle because there's a sort of, it breathes. There's a sort of beat within the beat and there's a pulse and Charlie's genius part of it and, and the Stones is to sit down and listen to these records and learn these things and Charlie recognizing that this simplicity is actually very sophisticated. Sure. And it's a lot of nuance. And how many guys do we both know who can play you, you know, you know, parts, you know, from twenty one twelve or you mm -hmm. know, some yeah. some spectacular drum suite? And how many guys can we sit on YouTube in their bedrooms playing note for note renditions of Moby Dick, but trip over themselves trying to play a shuffle or a punk rock beat because somehow they think yeah. it's beneath them or below them or too simple for it to be valid? But you know, no one's dancing to that drum solo. I guarantee you that. No, it's the Steve Jordan effect where you think on, on the surface it's simple, but then as you become more of a mature drummer, you go, holy cow, this guy is just doing something special. Like you said, it's just it's what you're not playing. It's it's the space. It's the not filling it up, um, which, you know, it's great that everyone can play those crazy rush songs because that's just impressive and it's cool. But when you're playing with a band, what they call it the money beat for a reason, you know, doing the two four, <laughs> that's boom. I mean, that's how you get a gig. 
And it's not just that. You have to, you have to play it. Well, I mean, there's this thing in rock music where it, it doesn't, you're not constantly communicating with the rest of the band, unlike in jazz, where hopefully if you're you know, a great jazz drummer, all the Jones are, Roach, you are communicating at all times. There's a conversation between the drummer and the rest of the rhythm section and, and the soloists or the ensemble, as it is. In rock, there tends not to be that. You lay the beat down and people play on top of it. You know, hopefully you can get in the pocket with the bass player, but that, that sense of conversation, that musical conversation, doesn't really exist in a lot of rock. Yeah. Uh, but with Charlie, when you're listening to it, there is. There's like, you know, it's, I always say, uh, it's about, I'm getting R rated again here, maybe PJ 13, <laughs> but it's about anticipation not penetration. That's <laughs> yeah. the secret. Yeah. Okay. That's, a good point. that's where it lives. You know, it's always the moment before the penetration. That's the most exciting part. And Charlie gets that anticipation, not penetration, because after that, where else are you going to go? You know, and you mm-hmm. know, John Bonham too, and Led Zeppelin, even when they're really rocking out, they never sound like they're in a rush. Yeah. It, it, there, there, there's, there's, a, there's a, there's a pulse and a pace to it. They never sound, it doesn't ever sound to me, you know, overbaked. They don't sound like they're flying off the handle. They're definitely in the pocket. Even when they're cooking, Bonham knows how to, you know, keep it where it belongs. It's anticipation, not penetration. And then when you get to that point, boom, you know, you know, yeah. it's time. Uh, but you know, no one wants the climax of the first note in any situation. No, I, I remember early on as a drummer kind of learning that with solos. And I would, you know, when I was working as like a drum teacher uh, at, I was with Sam Ash and stuff, and I would teach younger kids and I'd say like, you got to have somewhere to go. And it even, it even is like, uh, that's like something that you can take with you in life though. It's like, uh, I, I was course. a kid, I wanted to buy like this like DW set and I wanted to save up thousands of dollars, which would have taken forever. And someone told me like, you, it's going to feel better when you get there later as an adult. And um, honestly, I've still yet to buy that <laughs> kid as an adult, but it, it's like, you gotta, you gotta have somewhere to get to. You can't start like you're saying at 10 and then you, there's nowhere else to go. You need to start at one, go to five, come back to one, meaning like, you know, the level of intensity and, yeah. um, and it just, it's, it's really important, which I think those guys, um, which, in the topic of right drummer for the right gig, what do you think about this? What, like, let's maybe play a little game of like, how do you think if you take those four? And again, I realize there's tons of other ones, but I'm just talking about those big, big, huge mega four. Um, what if you switched them around? How do you think Charlie Watts would have done uh, in the Beatles? Aha! Uh-huh. I'm so glad you've asked this question. Um, there are some weird uh rock and roll arcana and some weird places where Charlie and Ringo play on the same record. Hmm. How about that? Um, hmm. um, the London Howl and Wolf sessions. Okay. Um, they play, and I think Bill Wyman's on, on the bass on there. Um, and Eric Clapton plays guitar and Ringo came down to play and he played for a day. And then Charlie Watts came in and played the rest of the sessions. And Ringo only made it on the final record. I think he's on one or two tracks and Charlie is on the rest. And oh boy, oh boy, can you tell the difference? Because mm-hmm. Ringo plays this kind of like, this, uh, uh, it's a funkier kind of beat that he plays. It's much, much different than Charlie Watts, who's really from the Chicago school and really understands this how and Wolf thing in a way that Ringo just simply does not. And this isn't a criticism on Ringo's drumming as a whole. Yes, His yeah. contributions to the Beatles are amazing. And the more I, I, I listen to it, the more amazed I am. He has that thing, too, where he's very autodidact. And as a rock and roll drummer, I mean, Ringo in the early days, the big open hi-hats, they were definitely listening to a lot of Little Richard, uh, really swinging everything, just really basically like – punk rock I mean, just yeah. beautiful beautiful uh rock and roll energy the whole bit but a lot of you know what i always say uh, uh bar two is of course in the rock and roll equation roll is the important part mm-hmm. okay the role is always more important than the rock okay little kids can rock you know you know rock <laughs> is 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 hitting something with a wooden stick without a sense of music to it you know roll is Swinging, Frank Sinatra rolls, Billy Holiday rolls, the Rolling Stones rolls, right? Yeah. Call the Rolling Stones, not the Rocking Stones, <laughs> right? Good um, point, yeah. but, but, you know, Led Zeppelin rolls. Of course, they play heavy rock, but it rolls. Uh, they grew up on jazz, big band, and they knew that Elvis Presley rolled and, uh, Carl Perkins and Eddie Cochran, uh, you know, and, and Richard, of course, all these people they love. Chuck Berry, of course, it rolls, it swings like crazy. And, you know, one thing is, and we talk about this too, and some of the drummer, the role has been systematically beaten out of the music over the years. Mm. And if you see, you know, your average bar band playing Johnny Be Good, they're going to lay it down with this like kind of straight ahead two and four. It doesn't really, you know, boom, straight ahead rock and roll beat. But if you listen to the record, it swings. It's got a yeah. jazz thing. It's all about the dotted eighth note, right? Sure. Um, it's it's not like that. Somewhere over the years, it's shifted. 
And, yeah. you know, people got the idea that it was easy to play this stuff. You know, oh, it's easy to play the blues, so I don't have to work on it. And that's the other thing I want to talk about, too, is um, I realize we've got to get back to the interchange of the drummer. With no, you're <laughs> and, fine. And, yeah. But, but um, it, it's so hard to play this stuff. When I got back to practicing, and I grew up playing the blues and all stuff, but I started playing along again with these Jimmy Reed songs, and they're not fast. They're, in fact, they're slow. Oh, my God. And you know it's much harder to play slow than it is yes, fast and to, keep, and, and to keep it together, you know? And the, the shuffle is so hard. And, I mean, I hadn't really worked on it in a long time because I haven't been playing the drums as much as I used to. And, wow. And, and just to keep that going, to be a really great blues drummer, it's so much harder, honestly, than, you know, I'm sure some people are going to be clutching their pearls, but than to be a great prog rock drummer. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's you're, you're, you're more exposed, you're naked playing those drums. And if it doesn't swing, everyone knows it. You know, you know no one's dancing to, to, to your Roto Tom solo. It's not happening, you know? Yeah. And no one's dancing to the guitar solo either. But I could say, so So then let's look, let's flip that and say that for the, let's say the prog rock people, which I love prog, I think it's awesome. Oh, me but too. But you, you sure. can't pluck Charlie Watts, maybe you can't. Let's say you can't pluck Ringo out and maybe, I know The Who isn't prog rock, but I'm saying with our example here, uh-huh. you, putting Ringo in The Who wouldn't quite be the same as uh, if you, I think, Charlie Watts and Ringo could maybe flip and be okay, and it would be it would be different, but it would be in the same sure. arena. But if you take, uh, let's say, um, Ringo and put him in The Who or in Zeppelin, that's like switching a prog guy and a blues guy where it's, it, you know, that's where it gets tricky, where the prog guy would be like, well, they can't do what we do. Um, what do you think that would be like to have Ringo in the uh, in in the Who? Would it slow everything down or well, would it simplify? Know, Keith, Keith Moon's one of these guys, and it's not just finding the right drummer; it's the drummer finding the right band. Yeah. Because you know the sword cuts both ways. Without the Who, you know, you know Keith Moon could have been wandering in the wilderness for his whole life. <laughs> uh, you know, unless he finds these guys who are willing to put up with the spectacular explosion, the symphonic explosion, you know, tom toms and cymbals, you know, in picturesque disarray, you know, with yeah. um, not a conventional sense of tempo. Let's be honest. Yes. He, he accelerates constantly. Uh, you know, sometimes the one is also lost out in the wilderness with the who, you know, and that's part of the thing. And, you know, their formula too is you got Keith Moon is playing with the guitar, not playing with the bass. And it's a, it's a weird relationship. It's not a conventional rhythm section. Uh, Keith Moon makes that band. I mean, as much as the other you know components do, you need it. Led Zeppelin, it doesn't work without John Bottom. There's yeah. no precedent for what he was doing. You know, the, the stuff he was doing, and of course, Jimmy Page understood it and knew how to record him. And it doesn't work without those guys. It, it, it yeah. just doesn't. And the Beatles, same thing. And anybody in the Stones will tell you, no Charlie, no Stones. You think it's Mick and Keith, they, they'll tell you it's Charlie. I think that that's a great point in general of, of, you know, if you're listening to this, you're probably a drummer where we're all aware of our importance. Uh, but the drummer's, um, you know, role in in kind of directing the band, because because all of these drummers we're talking about, minus Ringo, really, I was going to say, are the original kind of um, when the bands were at their biggest, these were the drummers, because I know I'm sure in, in most of these bands, there's first drummers and then people took over that uh, most famously the Beatles with Pete Best and all that stuff. But do you think that it's really, really, really on the back of the drummer to kind of like help shape the sound of the band? Well, I, I think what these guys have, these bands that we're talking about, is a sense of collaboration, yeah, which is huge, and it's treating the drummer as a musician. Go figure. <laughs> yeah, know? for sure. You know, I mean, listen, I mean, I, you know, I, I laugh like when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan, everybody went out and bought a guitar the next day. Right, except for people who were deemed not talented enough, who were sent to the drum department. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yep. which, which, which is a cry and shame uh, because again, no one dances to the guitar solo. Yep. Uh, and not that every, not all records need to be danced to either. There's all sorts of ways to play music, but I think this is what we're talking about here. Um, it's a sense of collaboration. It's allowing Keith Moon to be Keith Moon. It's allowing John Bonham to be John Bonham. It's allowing Ringo, you know, especially when the Beatles stopped making rock and roll records and started making kind of art records, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and things progressed, you know, drugs entered the picture and the sixties happened and everything stopped being so much in black and white and everything was technicolor, uh, to let him be Ringo. Yeah. Because those records don't sound cool with, you know, with a guy just playing the songs. 
Yeah, and, exactly. You know, and, and you know how it is. If you ever see bar, bar bands, that they, a lot of these guys play by memory. They say, oh, yeah, I know how to play, you know, whether it's uh, a Beatles song or a Stone song or a Chuck Berry song. And they because they've heard it so many times on the radio, they think they know it and they haven't really dissected it. And it never comes out the same way. Mm-hmm. It just never does. And you can't really imitate Ringo or Charlie Watts. What would be the point anyway? There's just too much. Because they're not playing from their hands. They're playing from their heart. Yeah. You know, and you yeah, can definitely sure. learn John Bonham parts. And everybody should. But I don't know how far that gets you unless you've got John Paul Jones and Jimmy Page, like, standing on either side of you. Yeah. that That's the... So... The the thing we're talking like the right drummer for the right band. That's what you're saying here is the key thing of the the right band. It is stars aligning. It is like lightning striking to get these four or five guys and girls of any great band together. It's just such like a perfect. It's so rare out of all the bands in the world, the ones that come to the top that have this perfect chemistry, and and that gets. Into the point of, let's say, John Bonham and Keith Moon, it's hard to replace. Obviously, they did go back out with Jason Bonham and um, Ish. They did a couple shows with Jason. Yes, did exactly. I don't mean. I don't mean like the band continued. The Who, the, the, the Who, yeah, you know, gave it a go with Kenny Jones, and it was it was awful, frankly. I mean, he was the wrong guy for the job. It was good on paper. You know, they they knew him. Kenny Jones is a wonderful drummer in the faces, the small faces, terrific. But he was not the right drummer for that job. The second he showed up, they should have thrown away his hi-hats. That's not how this band works. Um, By the time they found Zach Starkey, they they got it, because Zach understood the implications of what Keith Moon was doing without having to play exactly like Keith Moon. He knew how to kick the guitar player's ass. He knew it was okay to speed up. He knew it was okay to play with some band. He really got it. You know, um, I know they had a couple other guys sitting in. Honestly, I don't think anyone else got it before Zach. Yeah. You know, well, it was and that's too, just, I mean, it's Ringo's son. So there's something special about that. Well, yeah, he, he's got real providence, you know, providence, yeah. uh, you know, when he comes to it. But he was ability to free himself within, you know, the, the confines or the lack of confines of the Who's music to, to really, really let go. And when I got to see him play with the, the, the Who the first time, I, was, I walked away feeling like I'd really seen a Who concert. Yeah, that's so you're reading my mind right now by by thinking so. So when I uh, in 2019 saw the Stones and hopefully again on the 60th um, anniversary, see the Stones again, I feel like I am seeing the Rolling Stones. Obviously, it'd be awesome if it was the 60s or 70s, but there's something about that. The the circle hasn't been broken. Oh, my God. They are. And they are the last connection, the last great big blue spark of electricity that goes straight back to the beginnings of rock and roll that are still playing. If you're looking at that, don't forget, they learned literally sitting at the feet of Howlin' Wolf. Yeah. Okay? They were on the road with Little Richard. They were on the, they knew Howlin' Wolf. They were hanging out with Muddy Waters. They used to sit at the Apollo Theater watching, you know, James Brown. Can you imagine James Brown playing seven shows at the Apollo a day? Yeah. Right? The, right? Like seven shows a day starting in the afternoon. Okay. And just go and watch. They were there and they lived through it all. I mean, you know, I mean, the sex and the drugs, but never mind that. They, they lived through disco and survived. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, you know, and they came out with, you know, some girls and fought back, you know, against, you know, the, the, the blight of punk rock, but they did it on their terms and, and they blazed and they evolved. And when you see them, they are the last true connection, like uninterrupted, going all the way back mm-hmm. to that. And, yeah. It feels that even though, you know, the band is playing now, is playing at a much more relaxed tempo, they don't have to prove that they're the greatest rock and roll band in the world like they did in 1969 and, you know, the tour after that, 1972, which is probably, well, I would say that was the height except for 1978, which was just like mind blowing. Every time I look at that or listen to the Some Girls Live tour, it, it, it's incredible. I mean, the tempos are just, I mean, they're just blazing. Yeah. And 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 the intuition and the feeling and the vibe and the the sense of we're really out to like you know conquer the world. I mean, they got their mojo back, I and mean, I think they were adrift for a moment there. You know, 1975. You know, it was sort of becoming an arena band and getting away from, uh, you know, like like, like the, 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 the sweat and, and blood and guts sure. of the whole thing. Uh, but they they. You know, <laughs> when it was came time to fight back against the Sex Pistols, the Ramones, and people calling them old men, because you know, they were like thirty eight at the time. <laughs> yeah, uh, which, uh, boy, they they, they, they saw them now. <laughs> but yeah, they they came you know out of the gate loaded for bear, and, and it's pretty incredible. But you know, here's the thing too: I want to get back to. I know we're popping around here, but yeah. Charlie's drums so started getting louder. 
tattoo you. They're mixed so loud, right? The snare drum is just like it's overmodulated. It's not. It's really trashy. It's great, you know. I mean, they got this terrific sound by miking the snare drum and running it out to you know a bathroom and remiking it coming out of an amplifier, you know. Awesome. And, and it sounds terrific. It's so loud. It's really aggressive. And all of a sudden, I think they realized that Charlie is as much a signature, you know, of the band as as you know Keith and Mick are. Yeah. Everyone knows you hear that little off kilter things that Charlie Watts does, and you're like, oh yeah, it's Stones. Yeah. Which is nearly impossible to do for a drummer. Yeah, but I they mean, do. I, I mean, him and and it's again him and uh, Charlie and Ringo and and all of the ones uh, we're talking about. But like, there's something just that like you can tell in a second, which. To be able to get that signature sound out it, of just hitting things is and, is and style that thing. You know, uh, I listened to uh, some of the stuff with Kenny Aronoff for a while, who did the there were a couple of little transcriptions in the book, and, and Kenny helped me out with, with this. And uh, he says, like, you know, it's it's crazy because it's only t- it's it's two bars. Right, eight beats, and he speeds up, and there are accents in places. I, I'm, I, you know, Kenny's like this masterful charter of things. Yeah. You know, he obsessively charts everything, and um, we should plug Kenny's book too, uh, "Sex Drums and Rock and Roll," because yeah. it's quite excellent. Um, and that's about a guy who's got a work ethic like you know, it's unbelievable. Oh my God, um, yeah. but, but listening with Kenny, he says, to me, he says, you know, you know, no one would ever allow me to play the drums like this. It, you know, it would be considered wrong to speed up on a, on a you know, two bar intro, but he's trying to, he's either trying to get ahead of Keith or trying to catch up with Keith. That's the example of like, of Kenny is, is, uh, I mean, he's obviously been in a lot of bands, but he, and he's got so many gold records. It's unbelievable, but he's usually hired on to play. Whereas with Charlie, it's like, he has some weight to say, like no, I am a member of the band. There is no band without me. I can do what I want. I am. I am going to write my parts. And they also, I really think they, with a lot of these these, these classic rock bands like we're talking about, they helped define the sound together. So they're like, maybe it's just it's there. There's no replacing them. You know, right. not, not that you're going to replace Kenny Aronoff, but there's yeah. No, no, but it, but it's different because this is a band situation. It's a collaboration. Yeah, and whether it's you know. You know, Celine Dion or, or John Fogarty or, or whomever that Kenny's playing with. I mean, Kenny's great because he understands he's there to support the band, to support the song. You know, it's about putting the music over and ultimately your responsibility is to the audience. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and Kenny, Kenny's a genius like that. He gets that. But, you know, with, with Charlie, we're veering off maybe into art territory. Yeah. You know? And like, you know, people always told me my whole life, art is nice, Mike, but someone's got to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But that's it. You know, Char- you know I mean, I mean, when Kenny said that, I need to say that he was saying with the greatest admiration. Totally. You know, you know he's saying, yeah, I mean, this is crazy. He's speeding up, you know, uh, and the song hasn't even started. <laughs> uh, which is which is which is another myth, by the way. That Charlie Watts plays like a metronome. He's this perfect timekeeper, and sure, he can be. I mean, he can play with a click track all day long, but that's not the point. It's not supposed to be like that, you know. No. Going to Arlington territory one more time. Uh, although I'm going to dial down a little bit for <laughs> for all the kids in the audience, but you don't want to make love with someone who does it like a metronome. Yeah. Right. So why would you want a drummer who plays like one? That's, okay. The, the yeah. idea is sometimes you got to, there's got to be a little push and pull, right? Sometimes yeah. you push it through the, the, the choruses, you put a little zork behind the, the guitar solo, and sometimes you come out, you know, a little more relaxed. I mean, there isn't a single Stone song, I guarantee you, you know, that ends at the same tempo it begins. No, and there's certain things like, like I always think of like time is on my side, where like there's a tambourine hitting and a snare, and it's supposed to be at the same time, and it's, Total flanges. Very rarely on the same. It's like like it's 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 always a little off, but it's it's that feeling. And I think even, you know, what two years ago, which seems like insane uh it's been that long, in 2019 seeing the stones, I felt like it was a rock band, a four piece, which I think it, you know, five, six people are on stage, whatever. But the core guys felt just like a garage band in the best possible way, like a rock band blues band who's just kind of having fun and um that has that push and pull it, it absolutely does the, the tempos shift and i mean one great example not, not the stones but uh, if you listen to cashmere uh you know led zeppelin yeah. it slows down during the, the, the choruses sure. that's so hard to do but it feels right yeah you know it's you know it gets a little faster and it pulls back it's a little faster it pulls back yeah. you know and then you can compare this with you know any pop hit 
you know, like you know, contemporary pop music, and they're all like you know done in the box. They're all like you know they they, they do go boom 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 boom. boom. They are on a click or on the grid or whatever they call it these days. Yeah. it's very non organic. Yeah, Cashmere is um, a great example. I was listening to it the other day on the radio, and it's just like sometimes you just like oh I've heard this a thousand times. I'm going to change it, but it was one of those times where it's just like that do 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 like where he's just playing it just that simple beat with the guitar kind of you know off that that thing that's going on there just makes you bob your head and then every once in a while he hits a cymbal and it's just like oh my oh, god it's, it's literally epic and <laughs> what, I, what i always say is and here's some music theory for you okay it's a very very complex music theory so everybody get out their pens and papers <laughs> led zeppelin is the band that when you're listening to really loud when you're stoned you think the phone is ringing most when it's really not <laughs> yeah, and that's with your because mind. of those giant symbols. <laughs> it's like, oh shit, here's the guy with the phone. Oh no, no, it's just John Bonham. Yeah, well, like, oh, da, 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 da. oh, this not not the phone. It's yeah, just, just John Bonham. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, great, and that's a great thing too because you know, I mean, big symbols like that are something that should generally be avoided, you know, in most situations, and yet he's made it his thing. Yeah, absolutely. Get having your own sound. This episode is brought to you by Dream Symbols. Dream Symbols is launching the Tasting Tour 2021. There's going to be tons of cool symbols, members of the Dream Team on site, and the recycling program will be in effect all day at these various awesome music stores around the country. August 21st, they're going to be at In Stuff Music in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. September 4th, they'll be at Everything Musical in Columbus, Georgia. September 11th and 12th, they'll be at Epic Percussion in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. October 2nd, they'll be at Forks Drum Closet in Nashville. October 9th, Melody Music in Bloomington, Indiana. October 16th, Rhythm Traders at Portland, Oregon. And November 6th, they'll be at Rupp Strums in Denver, Colorado. So go out and check it out if Dream will be in your town. As you're joking around about music theory, though, I would love to jump over a little bit and talk about you, because earlier on, you mentioned kind of having all this free time and what you're going to do with it. And um, uh, I should mention, too, I said that you've been on another episode where we talked about this, but you, you gave a very good description there. People can listen to that as well about Charlie and about your own background and all this stuff. So, I mean, you've played you're, you're a guitarist, you're a singer, you've do, done all this really cool stuff. But during lockdown, you've really focused yourself to be a better drummer, which as an existing, you know, grown man drummer, sometimes it's hard to like go back and work on stuff. So tell us about that. What what got you back into relearning and, and bettering yourself kind of rudimentally? Mm-hmm. Let's say rediscovering. You know, I, so I came up on the drums. The drums were my first instrument. And um, I played the drums all over the world in a couple different uh, punk rock bands. Uh, the the Ron Chance, uh, for, for one, we played all over the place. And, uh, and now I'm working as a singer, and it's going over good. In fact, I'm on my way to Spain. Now things are open to sing with uh, a band called Guadalupe Plata. We'll be in Barcelona and Madrid and points in between in Spain. Uh, I have a new record out. It's called uh, The Devil Can't Do You No Harm. Uh, you can find it under Mike Edison on all streaming services, but I'm singing. Yep. Fortunately, I have as great a drummer as I've ever played with in my life, uh, who understands that being playing slow is more subversive than playing fast. Uh, and we've kind of put a little of that punk rock stuff behind us to get a little deeper into the thing, because the groove is the thing. But after writing this book and this experience of this deep dive of Charlie Watts and, and, and the rhythm and drums, and I'm, I love the drums. Like everybody that's listening to the show, I assume, and like, like you do, but I do love the drums. I, that's who I am. That's where I started. That's where I shall always return. I have, for the first time in my life, we just moved to a, a house. I have my drums set up because living in New York City, the least friendly place for drummers on earth. You can't set your drums up yeah. you know, in the house. But now I have them set up. My uh, Ludwig Super Classic Silver Sparkle set that, you know, that kid, every kid in the world wanted in 1969. And, 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 and you know, Living the dream, having the drums set up in my house. Um, I didn't have that uh, during the pandemic, though. What I did have was a practice pad and a metronome, which I never even owned a metronome in my life. I was self-taught. And I said, you know, I want to get back to basics. I want to hit the pad. I'm looking at a lot of this stuff. Uh, I got a metronome. And uh, I, I was self-taught, but I had a couple guys show me a few rudiments. And I, you know, I knew a few things and mostly got good playing with records and then playing in bands that somehow we got fortunate enough to go on tour and stuff. And I... You know, play the drums seven nights a week for years and years, yeah. but not in a long time. Okay. You, you find out pretty fast when you put the metronome on and you start playing paradiddles just how much you suck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I know. You know, the, the, to me, the greatest example of paradiddle playing will always be uh, Peggy Sue, Buddy Holly song with yeah. Jerry Allison. Sure. I know Charlie Watts is a big fan. Just streaming paradiddles. I think it's at about 140 BPM. It's just streaming paradiddles and it swings and it's groovy and it's like nearly superhuman to play that. Yeah. Wow. 
Okay, so let's set that as a target. Wow, I can't even touch that when I'm starting. So, you know, I'm getting there. But no one also told me that you could invert a parallel, you could play a backwards parallel. You know, I, I had no idea what the permutations of a six stroke roll were because I didn't really learn properly. So, I'm going through this thing and I'm learning a bit better. My doubles are getting better. My power tools are getting more even. I'm flipping some accents around and I'm starting to look at, you know, I mean, it was always fun to look at Buddy Rich, but I always kind of think it's kind of a parlor trick, to be honest with you, because once you could do that, where do you go with that? What do you do with it? <laughs> but also, musically, where does it fit into anything? Once you've seen him play his five minute drum solo, unless you're a super big band fan, and I like big bands, but where yeah, are you going to go? Sure. Well, I should say too, and I posit this in the book, I only think there are a couple of good drum solos in the history of the sport. You know, in the history of it, and I'll put Moby Dick up there for obvious reasons, and Sing Sing Sing, mm-hmm. which really furthers the song, and the greatest drum solo of all time. There it is. Wait for it. It's got to be Wipeout by the Safaris, right? Very um, good. It's the, yeah, those are good. Those are three very good ones. Only I, I, oh, Take Five by Joe Morello, unbelievable. Yes, right. And one great thing about Take Five, and this is so great, is that while he's playing that boom, 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 that that solo that's spaced out over you know the, the five pulse, the piano is still vamping. Yeah. So it's it's a drum solo in the sense that the band doesn't stop when the guitar solo comes. So why should the band stop when the drum solo comes? Yeah. And how come it took Dave Brubeck and Joe Morello to figure that out? And no one's done it since, really. Mm-hmm. Um, not like that. I mean, that was a pop hit. That was a jazz you know, pop crossover hit. But Wipeout's the only drum solo that everyone plays in the countertop. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Children, I mean, two-year-olds know that song. Like, I can, right. I can attest to that, that... That is just the most requested little kid song in the world. But also, everyone loves seeing the videos of ninety-year-old grandma playing Wipeout. It's just, oh, it's, it's captured. It's, it's. Uh, there's just something about it. It's uh, yeah. iconic. I had never learned to play it properly. I've been thinking no, I, it all these years. Me too. So yeah, you know, you know. But I went back, and there's a great video of the uh, Ventures doing it. Um, even though they didn't have the original version of it, but the Ventures doing it. Uh, I think in like 1969 or so, maybe later. Um, it's just absolutely you know blazing. And so I went back and tried to learn these things. And you know, then you get to the place like, so what am I going to do with all this great technique that I've just accomplished? Where does it even fit into the world? And this goes back to the premise of the book, and it's the beats the thing. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Nobody's hiring you to play a drum solo for forty minutes, you know. It, mm-hmm. it, you know, and and by the way, and Charlie Watts, it's, it's not that he's not good enough to play drum solos. He's too, he's good enough that he doesn't have to. Yeah, yeah, that's an right? interesting point. I've in my you know uh, years now of of finding these drum solo videos. They're really, of course, I go Charlie Watts drum solo, Charlie Watts drummer, Charlie Watts solo, and I try and find something. There really isn't one. And uh, he's not a solo drummer, like a drum solo guy. I think jazz wise, maybe he could he would fit more into that category of some kind of like jazzy solos with his side project. But um, that's interesting. You don't. And and the same with Ringo, which there are obviously a lot of parallels between the two. But you don't hear those guys. A couple of nice breaks that Ringo takes, but no extended solo. But also, you know, for all Buddy Rich's prowess no one ever leaves the show humming his drum solo good point you know and and, and, and and you know pure i mean it's unbelievable but it seems to me even when you, you know everybody leaves the stage and he does this great thing and it's amazing but where does it do to really further a song or make people dance which may not be the point of, of, of rush but in the context of rock and roll roll being the operative word here bands it doesn't really fit sing 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 absolutely wipe out absolutely yeah um and even, you know, time out. And there are a few others. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, even Art Blakey, who I really admire, the like comedy drum solos, you know, listen to Max Roach, uh, you know, and, and a lot of, uh, um, Bobby Dick is taken right from a, a Max Roach tune. You know, it's great, but it, it's not really about the solos. Mm-hmm. I mean, no one ever called me up and said, come over to my house, come, come to my bar and play a solo drum show. No. Well, I, in my, in my mind for a while, I've always equated it to like, like a comedian who is a stand-up comedian who can be by themselves versus a actor who is very, very funny in a movie or on a sitcom where they need what's going on around them to be great. But you might not be able to pluck them out and put them alone on a stage and have them kill for 25 or 30 <laughs> minutes or an hour where that's the drum solo versus the band drummer um, kind of, you know, mentality. Yeah. And I want this to be empowering for drummers too, that a band is only as good as the drummer. Totally. You know, and you can always get by. And by the way, the thing about the right drummer for the right band, the right band for the right drummer, we've all been in the bands where it was three guys and then the other person you could find who also who had a bass and was into it. 
Yeah. You, you know, yeah. or like, we have three guys. Oh, I know this guy plays sax. He'll come by and do it. But yeah. he was never really one of the guys. Sure. It, you know, yeah. it always happens that way. When you find four people that have that like fraternity, you know, you know, totally that, 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 that vibration together when you're really communicating telepathically, you don't want to screw that up. <laughs> no, know? no. And it's funny because the Stones refer to like, Ronnie Wood is like the newest member when he's been in the band for you know, 45 right. years or whatever. Right. Um, and he got it right away. You know, so exactly. to say that not everybody's interchangeable. I mean, obviously, Brian was replaceable. In fact, he was holding the back. Yeah. And partly because he was a bit of a drug casualty, but also because I don't think he had the vision to go where they wanted to go. Uh, Mick Taylor was great, but he was the guy. I mean, honestly, he's that guy. He was the guy they got because he was like signing like a gaudy free agent. You mm-hmm. know, he was a designated hitter who was going to hit, you know, 30 home runs and, you know, maybe bat for average, steal a couple bases for you and th- help you win the championship. And he was going to be gone in two seasons. Yeah. You know, like, you know, the power forward is going to score a goal and help you win the cup. But he was never really part of the core organization. And that was Mick Taylor. Yeah. You know, for all those talk about, oh, he was a virtuoso. Those records were great. I don't know who told him it was a good idea to quit the Rolling Stones. But <laughs> Ronnie walked in and they got along so well right off the bat. You know, there was a real, there's magic there. I mean, it's a real meeting of the minds. It's nice when you can't tell where Keith ends and Ronnie begins. Yeah. But that's a very special relationship. Now, jumping back here, I love it. I like all the stones just kind of because, you know, the the whole key of this and just a reminder to everyone that, you know, Mike here is obviously the author of Sympathy for the Drummer, Why Charlie Watts Matters. So if you kind of forgot, that's why we're peppering in, uh, you know, the great stones discussion. But I'd love to ask, too. So you've rediscovered your love of like, you know, really learning and you're pushing yourself forward with rudimental drumming. So the key things which I think you you are going to take away from all of that and just from talking to you is you're not going to let it mess up your your role you know what i mean not your role but like your rock and roll your, that swing being rudimental which i know that that's something interesting is you don't want to be too on the grid click so how how are how do you think you're going to take your new love of studying you know rudimental things but then put it into your own style of drumming it's a good question because i think about it because i would like to be on the be playing the drums in the band again right now i'm singing and i'm loving it and, yeah sure. uh, I, I can't you know it's, i can't believe this is happening i'm so fortunate to be playing the guitar you know someone's allowing me to do this you <laughs> yeah. know and, and then it's going over you know really well it's working yeah. um but also years and years took me to get there with the, the singing you know of course um but the drums i i like bands that are drums forward you know there's so many like uh you know, mod jazz bands, acid jazz bands, soul jazz bands in the 60s, and you know, the acid jazz kind of version of it that got copped later on, uh, where the drums are very forward, very swinging, very powerful, but it's really core to the group. I think a drummer-led band could be fantastic, but it is a band at the end of the day. It's, you know, that's kind of where it is. It's not a, a drummer and three monkeys on stage. It's sure. it's, it's musicians playing playing together. Um I, I, I love it when the drums are featured. I love a lot of the great little things that Art Blakey does at the beginning of a song, you know, where he sort of like brings it in with, you know, you know some flamboyance and some flair and some riffs. And Max Roach does the same thing. Uh, I mean, certainly John Bonham was, I mean, it's a very drum forward band. For <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which also comes through in the recording process to just say like, you know, like you said, Charlie got louder with these guys. It's like, you know, these drums start to get more turned up. The snares more. Oh, know, my God. Those last the records they put out for all of their flaws. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, Stones records as, you know, complete pieces of work. The drums are like a uh, uh, bigger bang, I guess, was the last studio record. Uh, the, the first song, boy, it just sounds like, you know, like, like an army invading. It's so freaking loud. It's like, and I think they realized that people, it, it like, it's the semiotics of the stones. Here's the sign and signifier that you put in your brain and you're together in your brain. You say, holy shit, that is the Rolling Stones. And then the guitar comes in right on top of it. And it's like, he's not really playing the drums anymore, Charlie. He's kind of playing the band. Yeah. In, in a way, um, it's become much bigger than that as a component part of a whole sound like Bonham did, like Keith Moon did, you know, like Ringo Starr did. Uh, and, and, you know, and then certainly certain progressive drummers have done it. And Alvin Jones, of course, is one of the great examples, you know, uh, could not, there's no Coltrane quartet without Alvin Jones. It's just doesn't, it's not the same thing. Not that John, John Coltrane didn't make records with other drummers, but that was it. I don't think anyone's going to argue with it. That band right there was the band. Yeah, um, for sure. You know, uh, I got to believe in the drums. Like I said, no, no one dances to the guitar solo. <laughs> you know? No, it's, and, you got to, it all works together, um, which, you know, maybe 
you working now as a guitarist and singer, but having that background as a drummer and, and a literally right now a practicing drummer, which I mean, I've obviously you're a great drummer, but it's, it's, you can always get better and work on things more. And, and I learned that by, uh, I've kind of been on a pause, but taking lessons with Barry James, who was George Lawrence Stone's, um, last living student. Well, wow, that's, that's going right back to like stick, stick you know, control. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, working on stick control with a guy who learned from the man who wrote stick control. It was like, it's just fun to do, but, but you know, man, practice is one of those things where, um, I guess it's like working out. I say that as a person who virtually never works out like you, you, once you start doing it, you kind of have to like, in for me in the back of my mind i have this like oh man i don't want to miss a day of practicing because it's it's a slippery mm-hmm. slope and, and yeah you lose it quick you lose it's- it quick and i've lost it in the last month or two where i need to just get a pad out and start practicing more and i still play obviously but but i'm talking about a pad yeah practice uh, yeah i i try to have one of those uh, remote silent stroke heads on a snare drum right yeah. now and i'm really digging that as a using as a pad because i get the rim shot you know yep. and it, it's um yeah it's kind of i'm Kind of right now. That's what the other thing too. I went on this quest to find the perfect drumstick, and I just played with two Bs for the first time in my life. These heavy drumsticks. Yeah. I just fell in love with them. They're really addictive. That's they awesome. get this unbelievable sound out of the drums. Probably not sustainable for like you know fifty minutes of like hard rock drumming. It's too big, <laughs> yeah. but they feel great. And then yeah, when I go back to my normal five Bs, it's like I'm flying around. Um, but that was part of it. Yeah, all this practice. You know, I mean, there are things like, am I ever going to learn to play Moby Dick? Like the record. Or any of the various live versions? Not exactly, but I don't really, I don't have to. I'm getting some of the component parts and some of the signature parts of it, and I'm deconstructing it. And there are so many object lessons within Moby Dick, mm-hmm. you know, exactly. um, that it's really helping everything else out. Like there's, you know, there's so much good, like, you know, the jungle drums and the parts of Max Roach, the parts of Jack Krupa, and uh, this kind of thing he does where, um, you know, your right hand is sort of tied to your left foot and vice versa. Right, the, the right hand is not tied to the hi hat, not the sure. bass drum. Whereas sing, 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 it's everything's on the one. Boom, 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 boom. And Moby Dick is bop, 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 bop. Right. I mean, yeah. for all you guys out there and girls who've been you know listening to this, you know what I'm talking about. But that once you get that going and you can move around, you could sort of use that palette and start you know throwing your own colors on it, get yeah. out your own paint set. Um, and so you know, that's fantastic. I think that's where I'm going with a lot of things. I can. It's not never been my thing to be able to play somebody else's part perfectly. But oh my, like I, I love Mitch Mitchell too. Uh, you know, I mean, there's another drummer. Without Tim, where would the Jimi Hendrix experience be? Absolutely, he was the best drummer at the time for Jimi Hendrix, who to me is just like so beyond every other like musician ever walk on the face of the earth, with the exception of maybe John Coltrane. I mean, just advancing the art so much forward and. You know, here we'll get in some trouble. I think you listen to the band of Gypsies, and it's not like those guys couldn't play, but they're not in the same league as the experience. It's much more flowing. It's much more fluid. It's much more in a conversation with the guitar. Maybe yeah. that wasn't the board of band of Gypsies. Maybe it was supposed to be that deep groove that they lay into. You know, but I listened to Voodoo Child with Mitch Mitchell on it, which is also pretty long. It's 12 or 14 minutes, whatever. And the whole thing just swings and swings and swings, and it's filled with surprises and musicality. Yeah. Well, there's a thousand different styles of drumming. And that's the cool thing is that there's each each one can be a case study. And and even you saying Mitch Mitchell, it just made me think like that's where it's a it's dangerous to do what I did, where I say, you know, those big four that I named, because then there's like Ginger Baker. There's all these favorites of everyone where no one really like we all kind of look at them, but no one really likes the, you know, the top 100 drummers because it's like who who have they forgotten now? You well, know? Oh, those lists are meant to create arguments, and that's what you know sells magazines or, or gets clicks on the internet. Uh, and, you know that's cool. I mean, but like, like Mitch Mitchell, like that little fill, little wing, that boom, 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 boom. It's like whoa. I, I, I'm never probably going to play little wing in a band ever in my life. No, but that little bit is so beautiful. Yeah. And there's a bit in if six were nine or six was nine. The thing there of like hit starting the fill on a tom tom and then kind of. Do, it's very melodic. That's something that can be applied to so much more. Yeah, absolutely. I don't follow recipes either. I cook all the time and I read recipes. I have cookbooks, you know, and my wife says, wait, we go through stuff. And we just cherry pick the parts we want and just throw the thing away and just make stuff. See, and- that, that's a good, that's a very interesting uh, uh, analogy there because like I, I am, I'm like you. I think you can, there's so many ways to go about it. Like I'm like you with the drumming where I might not list, I might not learn 
like dead nuts every single part to a cover song I would be doing with a band. And I have huge respect for people who do. But I, if I cook, like it's like two two tablespoons of olive oil. I'm measuring two tablespoons of olive oil. And my wife, though, is just splashing it in yeah. and like throwing. Oh, yeah. So there's there's different. But she ends up setting off the smoke alarm and the food is burnt. <laughs> and I'm like making it exactly the way it was. Oh, I didn't think the story was going to end like that. I, was, I, thought, I, thought, I yeah. thought she was going to she was gonna win this one. No, uh, no. Um, Hopefully she doesn't listen to this. I'm sure. But, uh, she does, but. Yeah, we cook a, a tablespoon for olive oil. Like, what are you kidding me? No, it's I'm, like how yeah. much olive oil goes in, into anything? An amount. I said That's two it. tablespoons, Mike. It, 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 it makes cocktails the same way. Sometimes I count it coming out of the pour. I do it by sight, do it by feel, do it by vibe. You start with good ingredients. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Right? Same thing with the drops. You start with good ingredients, good some sound principles, and, you know, on the spectrum of things that will get you further in life, talent, technique, taste. What, what, what do you think really is the one that's going to get you the get you the furthest. You know, I'm, I'm going to let you guys talk about that amongst yourselves. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. all the chops of the world ain't going to replace the fact that you've got lousy taste. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then knowing when you hear it, you know, the thing is, um, you know, here, as a writer, people always say, oh, if you're a writer, you got to write all the time. Oh, if you're a drummer, you got to play the drums all the time. But actually, you got to listen to the drums all the time. You know, if you're a writer, you got to read all the time. And when your stuff starts sounding like the stuff you admire, you know, you're getting close to the goal. Yeah, absolutely. But you got to be yourself. Everyone knows that, but you can definitely take your influences. And that's why you read to, to continue with the cooking thing. That's why you may read a cookbook, get the idea, look at the picture, go, okay, I can do that a little bit better. Um, they're, they're, it's not about better. I mean, that's the whole thing too. About the, this, who's the greatest drummer? You're asking the wrong question. Yes. I mean, not, 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 not you specifically. But no, by know. the way, who's your favorite I love drummer? the drum solos that you put up on the Drum History Podcast on the Instagram. I watch them all. I watch every single drum solo oh, you put up you. every day. And like, like no, I, I get all gooey and melty when I, when I watch them. I love the Brazilian guy with the singer that you're oh, up man. to. Oh, oh, it's like incredible. Because that's just like, that's a real conversation. And it's, you know, yeah. it's not a rock thing. Yeah. Because there is life beyond rock. That's and roll, for that for matter. It. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, it's that's a good point. That's beyond rock and roll. That's that's a different that's and, and I think we can all broaden our horizons. And that's what I try to do is bring those. Um, oh, uh, my God. There's so many ways to play music. I was teaching kids. The other thing I was doing during the pandemic was teaching kids to play music, uh, like non-instrument specific lessons. Sure. And rule number one is don't be a snob. Yeah. No you, one likes you know, that. Don't like say, oh, you know, I don't like opera. Really? You know, it's lasted 500 years. There's a reason for it. I get it. You don't have to like everything, but you know, opera sucks. I mean, listen to it, decide, you know, I'm not a big opera fan. I'm a big classical music fan, but I, I personally don't like a lot of the highly trained voices. It doesn't resonate with me, but you know, I go, I go, I go see the magic flute every once in a while because it's pretty awesome. You know? Yeah. And you know, that, that performer has put in more hours than probably, you know, yeah. probably more than all of us combined. Yeah, just it took them ten bad hours just to get good. Yeah. Never mind the part, and the and you know that's the other thing too is like the distance between like to, to get good takes a very long time, but the difference between good and very good is much shorter. But the difference between very good and truly excellent is, is massive again. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, this is just such a fun conversation about just like like I, what I want to do on the show more is as I, I I kind of fall into the and I think people like it the the you know this is the topic this is what we're going to talk about this is the history of this we do it boom. But uh, I want to try and do more episodes like this where I maybe talk to collectors and I talk to people uh, who are drummers because I, I sort of had an, a, an aversion to having on drummers to interview famous drummers because there's so many great podcasts who do that. There's there's other ones. So I, th- I thought, hey, I'm going to be different. I'm going to do the history stuff. But I, I do plan on doing that. So this falls into a really cool kind of. I, just I I appreciate it and and my book I mean simply for the yeah. drummer I mean yeah it's Charlie Watts on the cover but it really is about the history of drums yeah it is about the history of rock and roll drumming and I think that's why I got such an enthusiastic response um, it's partly because I didn't pull punches when talking about you know the foibles of classic rock drumming and and, and the Stones and you know everybody's human uh, I, I didn't pull punches uh, but also I talk about like you know everything that's adjacent to it, you know, like how much jazz is there really in black Sabbath a lot, you know, yeah, really. I mean, it's like, let's think about it. When these guys were growing up, they didn't have the benefit of Led Zeppelin. They were contemporaries. They had the benefit of the Betty Goodman orchestra yeah. and Gene Krupa yeah. and Louis Belson, you know, and that's what you hear when you hear Bill Ward and the first black Sabbath record to me, those, the wizard and war pigs, like, oh, this guy's been listening to big bands. Yeah. It's swinging. I love the wizard. I used to play that. Uh, oh God, as- I still play it all the time. I'm still trying to master it. Yeah, exactly. Now, um, everyone should, uh, for the month of August, 2021, 
keep an eye on my Instagram, drum history underscore podcast. Um, Mike is going to do something very cool, and uh, we're going to do a giveaway, and we're going to kind of do it through drum history where uh, he's going to give away not just one book. I mean, you're going to give away a handful of books. Yeah. Yeah, and, let me see um, how many I can squeeze out of my publisher. But uh, let's uh, spread the word, spread the gospel, the good news. Yeah, exactly. So, so keep an eye on the Instagram, um, and we'll post a video of Mike, and there'll be instructions on what to do and uh, how to get entered, and then Mike will choose the winner and uh, get some books out there. And it's it's people, someone's got to win. It might as well be you. Um, Mike, this has been awesome. So everyone listening, per usual, Mike is going to hang out and we're going to do a little Patreon bonus episode. And um, we kind of have this plan of uh, doing something kind of fun, a little different than the main episode. I'm going to ask Mike the question of what makes a virtuoso. And remember that Mike has a vast history and knowledge, just writing about music and just knowing all these things. It might not be, doesn't have to be just 100% drum related. We're talking in general, what makes a virtuoso, which I think can be kind of uh, subjective. So uh, if you want to hear that little bonus, go to drumhistorypodcast.com, click the Patreon link and uh, join up, which a lot of people have been doing. I'm really happy. I'm at about 30 people on Patreon, which helps, you know, just make this possible to keep doing and justify uh, doing it. On that note, Mike, Thank you so much for taking the time to be here and to do the bonus episode. And I'm excited uh, for you just to be getting your book out there even more. And um, it's just exciting stuff. Oh, man, it was a gas, gas, gas. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, yeah, birds of a feather. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing like uh, hitting things with wooden sticks to, <laughs> to liberate one's soul. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Mike. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.